this morning. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 John. We are journeying uh, through this book together. We're going to read out of the second chapter. Candice already had mentioned that, um, that part about do not love the world. And so I'm not really going to go into that portion of Scripture. But I want to go into this chapter as we begin to talk about John addressing God's people as the children of God and what makes us the children of God and how it helps us then to live our life and to live out our faith. I, I want to remind you it was the same John that wrote about being born again in chapter 3 of, of the Gospel of John. You know the story where, where Nicodemus came by night. He came secretly to have a conversation with Jesus about, about the idea of the, the teachings of Christ and the kingdom and what was going on and, and what was this, as he called them, this rabbi really trying to say to the people. And it was in that conversation, that secret conversation, where Jesus told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're not far away, but here's what you need to know. You must be born again to see and to perceive and to enter the kingdom of God. You see, my friends, when we are born again, it is something that happens by the, the Spirit. Yes, we, we repent and, and we acknowledge that we are sinners. And John tells us that that's one of the tests that we need to, we need to you know, apply to our own lives is that we acknowledge that we are sinners. But watch this. When we do that, then we become born again by the Spirit of God and we enter into the family of God. Now, that secret meeting took place between two people, which means that Jesus must have spoken to John or to the rest of the disciples to say, listen, this is the way you're going to enter the kingdom. You're going to enter by becoming born again because you, unless you are born of the Spirit, remember what Nicodemus said? Nicodemus said, can a man, you know, re-enter a mother's womb? How, how am I going to get back in there? You know what Jesus said? He said, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the law. How is it you don't understand these things? Jesus had an expectation of Nicodemus that he would know these basic things and the principles. And he said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. And so I'm talking to people that are born of spirit because when John writes, he uses this word technia. Everybody say technia. Oh, come on. Everybody say technia. He's writing to the born ones. He says, I'm writing to you, little children. Because you know God. I'm writing to you, little children, because you're born of the Spirit, be, because you're born into the family of God. I'm writing to you because, my friends, listen, that's what makes you part of the family of God is that you've been birthed by the Spirit. There are so many churches today. Listen, listen. They are filled with people but not necessarily by the children of God. Churches that are filled with people, but not necessarily by the children of God, which means we must be born again to see, to perceive, and to enter into the kingdom. I want you to turn in your Bibles, 1 John 2 and 1. 1 John 2 and 1. I'm going to, let's stand as we read the word of God. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. Because here's what John is saying. John is saying, because we are the children of God, certain things apply to us this morning. He says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. We don't hear about sin anymore. He says, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate. Everybody say advocate. Notice it's with the Father. John talks a lot about the Father. He says, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the big word there. Big word, but here's what it really means. Substitution, exchange. He took our place. He's your substitute, right? Notice what he says, for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. So watch this, friends, watch this. Jesus isn't the savior of the Christians. Jesus is the savior of the world. That's why Christmas time we celebrate that the savior of the world has come. He says, now by this we know that we know him. Remember over 30 times John used this word know. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a, wow, you're a liar. You're a liar. He who says, I know him and does not 
keep his commandments as a liar, and the truth is not in him. You know, my friends, I'm, I'm getting so tired of political leaders that for, for votes and agendas will tell you, I'm a person of faith. But yet you pass wicked policies that are against God. You say you know God, you're actually a liar because the truth isn't in you. Because if the truth is in you, then you're going to stand for the word of God. We, we ought to begin to test some things and test some people and, 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 and ask them, well, what does that mean that you're, well, you have faith in a rock and a tree and a piece of mud? Who is it you're worshiping? That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed. Paul said, I know who I know. I know who saved me. He said, I'm not ashamed. And so he says, if, if you say I know him and you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. But whosoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected or matured in that individual. By this, we know that we are in him. There it is again. By this, we know that we are in him. And he who says he abides in him ought also to walk just as he walked. In other words, if we're saying we're in Christ, that word walk means to live out our lives, to live out the expression of who we are, just like Jesus would live this life. So my friends, that when people look at us, they're really seeing they're seeing Jesus. And remember that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. Lord, we bless you for your word. We ask that you would engraft it into our hearts. We, we thank you that every heart, every mind be opened to your understanding. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will expand our capacity for knowledge and wisdom and for application in the mighty name of Jesus. That, Father, not only will we read the word of God today, but may the word of God read us. And all the people of God said... Amen. Come on, virtually high-five somebody. Virtually high-five somebody before you are seated. Hallelujah. What a day. What a day. Hallelujah. How many understand, though, we're going to get past this season? Amen. We're, we're, we're going to get through this, and God is going to continue to work in a mighty and in a powerful way. Because the truth is this, even by studies, many people online are, are researching and, and asking questions about spirituality, asking questions of Google, how do I find God, and what's going to happen to me, and what about my life? And so, my friends, it does say that there is a hunger amongst people because people are desperately looking for the truth. They're desperately looking for the light. They're desperately looking for an answer. And my friend, you, you and I, you and I are that answer. We have that responsibility. The Bible says to give an answer in season and out of season of what? Of the hope that abides within us. Can anybody say amen? Come on, is there a hope that abides within you? We're not like other people. We're not, we're not in despair. We're not, we're not going to lose our lives. We know whom we have believed and we know who is faithful. And so this morning, even as John begins to write to the, to the born ones, and I, I begin to speak to you as born-again believers, and, and I, I want to encourage us even in this, in, this, in this book that John begins to write because the book is really about contrasting, contrasting God and the Antichrist, contrasting light and darkness, contrasting evil and good good because we are we are living in a day my friends where everything is confused we're, we're living in a day where there where there, there's no absolutes and people even some of God's people that are listening to to pop culture and the voice of the day and what's popular rather than looking to the word of God for those of you parents Parents of, 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 you know, younger children, particularly teenagers in those, in those young teenage lives. I, I, listen, parents, uh, those of you that are watching online today, I encourage you to sit down with your children. Begin to ask them questions about what they really believe because it might actually shock you what they really believe because what they're believing is a lie. What they're believing is what they're being told consistently and being bombarded with consistently. And when they look to the Word of God, they're actually being taught that the Word of God is a lie and what they're being taught by the world is truth. But how many know that the reverse is true? The light that's being espoused today is actually darkness. It's, it, it, it's incredible to me the abominations that are being presented as the new light and the new revelation and this is the new truth and that everything is God, and, uh, everything that is God and everything that is Bible is, is actually full of hatred and, and is against humanity and, and the whole nonsense of it. But even in the birth of Christ, the kingdom of said, I have good news. Literally, the gospel means good news. 
God said, I'm sending my son to reconcile the earth and to reconcile people to me. But, but here's the truth. Jesus said, the light has come. But watch this. People love the darkness. They love the things that are vile. They, they love the things that are evil. They, they love to do things in darkness because, let's be honest, there's, there's pleasure in it. We, we read that in the scriptures. We, we read that there's pleasures in these things that, that the, uh, the flesh craves. But something has happened to the born ones. We once thought a certain way. We behaved a certain way. We, we, we went to certain places. Now watch this. Not because, not because we have become religious. The truth is, in many cases, we used to be religious and now we're not. I was with a group of people yesterday. And it was funny. You know, as a, as a pastor, they, they look at you as being religious. They look at you as doing religious things. But in reality, I said to them, listen, I'm actually less religious than you are. People were like, what? Because I said, here's the definition of being religious. Being religious means you have a, a code of beliefs, but you only practice them when it's the high holidays. Come on now. But we're not religious people. We, we practice our faith because we're walking in Christ. We're walking in the light. We're, we're living this life out of our relationship with God. It's not about form. It's not about ritual. It's, it's not, listen, even on a Sunday, it's not that we have to be here. It's that we want to be here. We want to worship God because it is something that comes from our connection with God because John says we abide in him. We live in him. We walk in him. But we'll see, when you're religious, there's something that says, boy, I, I better check off a box so that God doesn't get angry at me. I better tick off that box so that, you know, for the next six months I'll be okay because I just did God a favor or, or I throw some money at him or I do something that, that, that stirs that piety within us that we've done something spiritual. And God is saying that's not what it's about. That's being religious. But in relationship, we do it because we want to please the heart of the Father. We do it because we know that Christ is righteous and what we want to do is be righteous like him. So because we are the children of God, because we are born again of the Spirit. And my friends, if you're not born again of the Spirit, the Bible is very clear on how we become born again. It's very easy. The Bible says you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. That what? That Jesus is Lord. That he's the Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he is who he says he is, and that he can deliver on what he says he promised. I said to my class on Thursday, I said, you know, I really believe that if we were just to remove Jesus from our faith, we would actually be acceptable to the world. Hmm? Just remove him. Just, just get, just, if you just remove him, then we're fine because then we become like every other organization and we become like, like, like every other religion. But here's the difference. The moment you remove him, you don't have any faith. You don't have a savior. You don't have a Messiah. You don't have salvation. You don't have eternal life. You don't have the promises of God. You're not in covenant with God. You're not in the family of God. So all you have is another religion with a bunch of rules. And this is where Jesus got in trouble, my friends, as he walked uh, through the earth and he was teaching and the, the religious people, whom, by the way, can I just help you? When you look at Jesus, I want you to notice something about him. Jesus was hard on religious people and soft on sinners. You notice that? Hard on religious people and soft on sinners. The only time, you know, I asked my class on Thursday another question. I said, if you had the power to take over a, a people, I said, would you destroy their, their temples? Would you destroy their, their icons and, your, and, and their monuments and build on top of it? Or would you just carry it on? I, I want you to notice that the only time Jesus lost his cool and went WWF on people was in his own house. Nobody's temple. No other religion. But when he came into the house of God, he said, you've turned my father's house that is a house of prayer into a den of thieves, and, and, and he became, literally became violent in his own house, not in other houses. But see, we have it in the reverse today. We're, we're soft on the religious. We're hard on the sinner. What do, you, what, do you, what do you expect the sinner to do? They're going to sin. That's why the Bible says, don't look at those people as your enemy. We're not fighting against them. And so here we are. We're the children of God. We're the born-again ones. And, and here's, the very, here's the very first thing that John says. He says, you know, if you're born of the Spirit, you don't sin. Well, pastor, I sin all the time. That's because we're not perfect. But watch this. 
It's not a perpetual, consistent, here's what I want to do consistently. I'm looking for the wrong thing. I'm looking to do the wrong thing. No, that's the spirit of the evil one. But if you're born of God, you're actually looking for ways not to sin. You don't want to do the wrong thing. You want to do the right thing. Now, Paul did say, you know, the good I would do, I don't do. And then the thing I don't want to do, I end up doing. But, the, but that just means that there's a struggle inside of us because we want to do the right thing. We want to be righteous. And, and how do you feel when you do the wrong thing? When you have grieved the Spirit of God, you get that, you get that sick, nauseous feeling. But my friends, listen to me very carefully. Because the more you sin, the more that, that sensation of grief goes away. In other words, it becomes normal to sin. It becomes easier to sin. But if we're born of the Spirit, the Spirit is faithful where he will convict us of our sin. But John says this, if we sin, we have an advocate. We have a defense lawyer. So if we have an advocate, that must mean that somebody is prosecuting us. And we know that the Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. The devil is, is constantly in God's face accusing you, ridiculing you, bringing you into shame, bringing you down, making you feel like a piece of dirt and a piece of lint. But the reality is this, that for every accusation there is more grace. For every guilt and ridicule, my friends, I want you to know that the great high priest, he stands for you. He advocates for you. He defends you in front of the judge. And who's the judge? Your father. Your father is the judge. Jesus is your defense attorney. Listen to the message Bible. I love the way, I love the way he puts it in here. He says, I, I, write, I write this, little children, to guide you out of sin. But if anyone does sin, we have a priest friend in the presence of the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When he served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the sin problem for good, not only ours, but also the whole world's. Here's, here's how we can be sure that we know God in the right way. Keep his commandments. If somebody claims I know him well but does not keep his commandments, is obviously a liar. His life does not match his words. But the one who keeps God's words in, 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 the, in the person in whom we see God's mature, is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure we are in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life that Jesus lived. So my friends, rather than get into despair, rather than get into condemnation, allow the grace of God and understand that you have an advocate. You have a defense lawyer. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus literally intercedes and prays for you. Do you know that? How many would like Jesus to pray for them? He's praying for you. Dead people are not praying for you. Angels are not praying for you. Saints are not praying for you. If you, if you come from my background, a Mary, the mother of Jesus, is not praying for you. All these wonderful people that even have gone on to be with the Lord, they're not praying for you. Your, your grandmother, your grandfather, maybe somebody that has, that has passed on, they're not praying for you. But Jesus is praying for you. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's your advocate. Can anybody give God praise for that? Come on. And then he says this. He says, listen, if you're God's children, he says, I have a new command for you. And what is the command? The command is to love one another, to agape one another. My friends, the love that John is talking about here, and, and he's described as the apostle of love. I mean, this is the apostle that was the closest to Jesus. No wonder that John talks so much about the Father because he learned the Father through Jesus. But he says, I, we have a new command that we're to love one another. This is why Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another. As a matter of fact, John says here, you cannot hate your brother and then say you love God. You can't hate the person you've seen and then say you love a God that you have not seen. But watch this, if we, are, if we are connected to God and then the love of God, because John tells us this, that God is... Love. Love is bizarre today. 
People, people ascribe a lot of things to love and what they love. But, but in reality, what John is talking about here, it is the highest love. It is the agape love. And here's what Jesus said about this love. He says, no greater love has this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. It's a sacrificial love. It's, it's a love that, that puts people above anything else. It, it is a love that respects. It is a love that honors. It, it is a love that truly shows the heart of God. Listen, listen again. I want to go to the Message Bible in verse 9. Anyone who claims to live in God's light and hates a brother or sister is still in the dark. If, if your heart is full of hatred, you're in darkness. There's something wrong with your understanding of Christ. Verse 10, he says, it's the person who loves brother and sister who dwells in God's light and doesn't block the light from others. But whoever hates is still in the dark and stumbles around in the dark and doesn't know which end is up, blinded by darkness. Notice what he says. You veterans, uh, in, the, in, the new, in the New King James, he says, I write to you fathers. Notice what he says, you veterans know the one who started all, all you newcomers, such vitality and strength, God's word is so steady in you, your fellowship with God enables you to gain victory over the evil one. At the end of the day, my friends, watch this, how do we overcome evil? We overcome evil with love. It's not a tooth for a tooth, it's not an eye for an eye, it's not retribution, it's that we love people the way God loves people. You ever had an experience, ever, ever prayed for people? I, this morning, you know, in my, in my office, I was praying for somebody, an unsaved person that I, I really want, you know, the opportunity. I said, God, because they're, they've been diagnosed with something and it might, it might affect their mental capacity. And I said, Lord, before their mental capacity is gone, give me, give me an opening. Give me an opportunity that, that I might share the love of God with this individual. And, and, and my friends, you know, all of a sudden, the, the love of the Father began to flood my heart regarding this person. Ever experienced that? You're praying for somebody and, and it's not your emotion. Sometimes you might not even like people. This is why the Bible says that we're even to be good to our enemies. That's hard, isn't it? It's hard to be good to your enemy. It's, it's hard to bless those that persecute you. It's, it's hard to, to speak well of the people that speak evil of you, but that's actually the kingdom. That's, that's the process and the protocol that Jesus has, has taught us. Listen, sometimes we can't even get along with our own people, never mind with our enemies. But it says to me, that in, order to, in order to get there, you're going to have to lose some pride. Hmm? And lots of it. You're going to have to lose some entitlement of I want to be right and I, I've got to defend myself. And, you know, you know the person that says the person that defends themselves has a fool for a lawyer. You have a lawyer. Jesus is your lawyer. Ask him to defend you. But, if, but have you ever experienced that? You may not even like somebody, but then you begin to pray for that person, and all of a sudden your heart becomes flooded with, with God's love and God's burden, and you look at the situation, and you say, yeah, but they're a sinner, and I know this about them, and they've done this thing wrong. And they, isn't it amazing how we know all the wrong things other people do? we got an inventory on their sins. That's, that's why I think Jesus told a story about a plank and a speck. Jesus said, listen, before you go do surgery, make sure that plank, that beam is out of your eye before you become what? A speck inspector. Hmm? We're great at seeing everybody's specks, everybody's little splinters, but the beams that are, you ever wonder, you say, like, how can you not see that about yourself? Hey? Hey? Ever have people tell you that? You're like, oh, I, that's not me. Everybody's going, yeah, that is exactly you. But the love of God reveals these things. That, and you begin to sense the love of God, and you're like, Father, this must be the grace. Why, church? Why? Because every time God looks upon the earth, every time God looks upon you, every time God looks upon the world, he is now seeing through the lens of the blood of Jesus. 
the sacrifice of Christ and all that Christ did. That is the lens that God looks through. Why? Because the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his son. See, Jesus loved the Father. God loved the world. My friends, the Father is not your enemy. He loves you. He loves you with an agape love. And then he says this, because I love you with an agape love, I want you to do the same. I want you to walk in the same way. And so, and so even uh, Paul says to us that, watch this, when we are good to our enemies, we actually heap coals of fire upon their head. In other words, in other words they, are, they are ashamed by their behavior because we display the goodness of God. But watch this. The only reason we display the goodness of God is because we act out in the nature of our Father. Because your nature would be different. My nature would be different. You know, I, um, I, I don't know if it was, uh, there was a movie that came out about uh, somebody wanting to be like God. And, and it, was, it was interesting how, how, how everything they did when they got power, right, they did for their own benefit rather than, than, and than what was good for the whole. And they absolutely created chaos. Why? Because we have a selfish nature and God is unselfish. The agape love of God. Number three, because we are the children of God, here's what John says. John says the anointing is superior. Everybody say the anointing is superior. Let's go back to the Message Bible just for a moment. Verse 18 says, children, it's time is just about up. He says, you heard that Antichrist is coming. Well, they're all over the place. Somebody can say amen to that. Antichrist is Everywhere you look, that's how we know that we're close to the end. I mean, everywhere that you turn, this idea of anti not only means to be against, but literally it means to replace. We want to replace your anointed one. We want to replace the, the spirit of Christ. Isn't it amazing that we don't, we don't hear about any anti-spirit of any other faith or religion, but when it comes to Jesus... Hmm, why? Because it's a spiritual battle. It's, a, it's not just political or, or, or some people have an agenda. Listen, it is literally birth in the spirit, and there is a hatred for Christ. There's a hatred for Christians. There's a hatred for the Bible. Why? Because it teaches you about eternal life and the way you ought to live. And unless your eyes are open, I want to say this online, unless your eyes are open, you are going to hate everything about God. You think he's a punisher, you think he's a restrictor, you think that he's a bad father, you think that he doesn't want to give you things, but the reality is, and Candace told us earlier, that the father knowing what's good for us. Hello? It's amazing, you know, I, I'm just learning so much from the birth of my grandson and even uh, the stages of, of, of development, and you know, uh, I'm going to say this online. I'm, I don't know if my daughter is watching, but, you know, being in an Italian uh, household, probably the Guyanese are probably the same way. But, you know, uh, I, I, you know, because the moment, you know, I, I feed him, you know, he's probably coming over today and I'll feed him. We're going to watch golf together and, and, um, and I'll feed him. And then when you pull the bottle out, he cries. He looks at you like Nonu, which is a grandpa in Italian, right? He's like, what, 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 why did you pull that out? Where's, where's, and he'll, he'll cry, and then you got to kind of calm him down. And so, and so you know, I, I argue with my daughter, and I'm saying, this child, this child is not being fed enough. we got to feed this child more. Now, my grandson will eat until he vomits. And so she says to me, Dad, Dad, if we overfeed him, he's going to vomit. He's going to throw up. Because his little stomach, now watch this, his little mouth wants to take it, but his little stomach says, hey, this is too much, and bleh. right? So every time I'm like, oh, and we argue, this child's not being fed enough. So the next time, the next time my little grandson vomits, I'm going to say, you know, you're overfeeding this child. <laughs> but, but watch this, according to his instinct, he just wants to be fed until I throw up. But, but what? It takes parents and it takes adults to say, hey, we, we know that you've actually had enough. You're actually okay. You're actually, you don't think you're satisfied, but really, really you, you are. And if we overfeed you, it's not a good thing. And yet, and yet he's crying, he's screaming, he wants to be fed. And, and many times we're like that. We want more, we want more. And God says, listen, if I give it to you, you're going to throw up. Take it into the Old Testament. 
They said to God, we're tired of your cooking. Can't stand this manna. Can't stand it. You know, in the 9 a.m. service, Candace was talking in tongues. She was given a code about something about trinnies and something they eat. I'm going to have to get the translation. But, 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 but really, the children of Israel were saying, we're tired of your cooking. It, 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 it's, it's just no good. We want flesh. Give us flesh. And God said, I'm going to give you so much flesh. The Bible said, and you forgive me because it's almost lunchtime, but forgive me, but the Bible says they threw up so violently that it literally came out of their nose. You ever had that happen? Like it's bad enough from your mouth, but when you, you ever had that, that, that force? It's almost lunchtime. <laughs> I want you to remember that image when you go to, <laughs> when, when you go to eat this afternoon. Huh? Come on now. Come on now. But God has got to say, listen, I know what's best for you. I, I know what's right for you, and you need to trust me that I, that I know. And so John says here in verse 26, I have written to warn you about those who are trying to deceive you. All my friends, there's deception everywhere today. But watch what he says, verse 27. But they are no match for what is embedded deeply within you, Christ's anointing no less. You don't need any of their so-called teaching. Christ's anointing teaches you the truth on everything you need to know about yourself and him. Woo! Isn't that what I prayed? You know, my friends, we can read the Bible, but what a ha why not have the Bible read you? You ever have the Bible read you? Ever have the Bible talk to you? And then you close it right away. You're like, oh. wrong chapter. Wrong verse, new book, new book. No, the Bible's reading you. Huh? You turn on a Christian song and it's reading you. Click, change that, you know. Somebody calls you and they're reading you like that but you know what it is church it's the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit but he's saying listen listen you're anointing the one that's bedded into you listen he, he says it's 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 telling you about you and, and and him and it's uncontaminated by a single lie he says live deeply in what you have been taught everybody say the anointing is superior See, what, what had happened was that some people that were in their group had left them and now we're coming back and we're teaching some false things. And what John is saying, by the way, I've heard people say, oh, see, we don't need to be taught, Pastor, because John says, no, no, no. What John was saying is you don't need to be taught false things because there is an anointing in you that my friends ought to be able to tell you what the truth is. You know, we are hearing so many things, so many lies, so many deceptions. But, you, but have you ever noticed that there's something within you that when you hear something, Thing. It sounds like the truth, but on the inside, something is telling you something is wrong with this. Huh? Somebody wrote a song and said, if your lips are moving, you must be lying. I could tell you who it is, but then you would accuse me of being carnal. But some people, it's like, your lips are moving, which means you must be lying because there is something in my spirit. And a lot of people go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. We're, we're going to believe that because of the mob mentality, because they're nothing but sheep, and they just follow and believe everything they're told. But in you, you know there is something wrong. There is something wrong in this scenario because people are allowing that, that gift of discernment, not suspicion, that gift of discernment to say, hey, I know something behind the scenes of what's happening here. God didn't call us to be deceived. Last point, worship team, you can come on up. Or the children of God. Didn't the worship team do a great job today? Amen. Listen, listen, listen. The child of God is ready for his return. Now, friends, this is the same John, the same apostle that John 15, he writes and he says, abide in me, and I'll abide in you. Because he said, without me, you can do nothing. So my friends, if we're not abiding, we're a fruitless people. Our lives are fruit. The, the, the tree of our life has nothing. And, 
And, and, and listen to 1 John 2 at 6. He says, he who says he abides in it ought also to walk just as he walked. And here's how John ends this chapter. He says, and now, children, born once, stay with Christ. I can't tell you how many times, even today, I'm with pastors. How many pastors say to me, we've got to stick together. We've got to stick together. We have to encourage one another. I, I, I am so thankful for encouraging people. He says, now, children, stay with Christ. Live deeply in Christ. Then we'll be ready for when he appears ready to receive him with open arms with no cause for red-faced guilt or lame excuses when he arrives. You know, in my day, we used to say, that's so lame. I don't know if people use that term anymore. Maybe I'm, anybody use that term? That's so lame. Yeah, it's still, oh, I'm still applicable. Praise the Lord. <laughs> that's, that's what he says. Don't be lame. Lame excuses. Watch, watch verse 29. He says, once you're convinced that he is right and righteous, you'll recognize that all who practice righteousness are God's true children. I ask you, I want to ask you online. Are you convinced that this is true? That this is right? It's not a lie. It's not full of hatred. People have turned this into a political agenda because they want to justify their lifestyle and their behavior, which is rooted in evil and darkness. Wicked policies that are being passed that are against God and life itself. Are you convinced? I'm convinced. Are you convinced? Nobody has to convince me that God is right and righteous. I know who I believed. And so John says, that's what makes us the children of God. And my friends, that's what makes God good. He's a good father. And John says, little children, this is why I'm writing to you. Will you stand with me this morning?